Well, we're uh, continuing our series today, as you saw, on the whole thing of faith that works, developing a faith that works. And uh, one of the great things about this first chapter in the book of James is that uh, it gives us a lot of practical advice about how to conduct our lives and to really live a life of faith. And this morning we're talking about uh, how to make up your mind, how to make up your mind. And I want to just read the first, uh, the James 1, 5 through 8, these four verses that kind of we're going to be looking at more in depth today. So now if you can just project it, I think we'll be good to go. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generally to all. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all he does. You know, many of us, uh, if we were to admit it, suffer from time to time what's, with what's called decidophobia. Decidophobia, and it's the fear of making a wrong decision. The word decide really comes from a Latin word, decido, and, and it kind of has two meanings. On one hand, it talks about, you know, making a decision, but on the other hand, it, it refers to falling off. In fact, the word deciduous, when it talks about leaves falling off the trees in the fall, comes from that. And I think there's something about a decision, especially a really important decision that we have to make in life, that feels very much like we're taking a plunge. We're taking a plunge. And uh, it's been said, you know, when you jump off a cliff in faith, you're praying for one of two things. Either God's going to catch you, or you're going to have to learn how to fly. You know, one of the two. And so, indecision, indecision can be very worrisome. And I don't know how many of you are facing an important decision right now in your life. I know uh, major purchases often can feel that way. Obviously, life choices. When young people decide to go to college, pick a college, maybe you're working through a situation where you're deciding about your job, whether you should quit your job and look for something else or to move and buy a new home. All of those kind of decisions, you know, are huge. And Indecision and worrying can seem like, you know, you're just in a rocking chair. You're just going back and forth, back and forth. And, of course, the problem with that is, you know, it gives you something to do, but it really doesn't get you anywhere. And so uh, I think it was Mark Twain that said, I must have a prodigious quantity of mind. It takes me as much as a week sometimes to make it up. And here's the deal. You know, just how should we make up our mind in some of these big decisions and make a major decision in our life? Well, James provides four very practical things that we can do, and that's what we're going to be looking at today, to overcome decidophobia. So first, in verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So the first thing that, you know, we really want to think about is to seek God for wisdom. You know, we go to the source of wisdom, and we pray that that's our first reaction rather than our last resort. And a lot of times, you know, it's like an addendum. We finally come to, well, maybe I should pray about that. But God invites us to, right at the outset, right at the beginning to pray, and in James 1.5, in, in the J.B. Phillips translation, I like this. It says, if in the process any of you does not know how to meet any particular problem, he has only to ask God. All you have to do is ask God. And Jesus sort of said the same thing in Matthew chapter 7. He said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. And then he goes on, and I've referred to this in recent weeks, but it's just such a good passage. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to you? And here's the deal. You know, God loves to give good gifts. 
you know, there's something about walking in a reverence for God. In fact, it says in Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. You know, when we have a reverence for God and a desire to please Him in all that we do and the decisions that we make, there is a heart of God that goes out to us that desires to reveal His will to us. If we're asking Him and desiring to know His will, it's His delight to give it to us. And walking in that dimension positions us to receive the wisdom that God wants. Now we know Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived, he wasn't born that way. If you read the life of Solomon, you realize he was given that incredible wisdom from God that brought people from all over the world to sit at his feet and bring him tons of gold just to be in his presence. He got that because he asked God for wisdom, not for himself, but to govern God's people. It was a gift that God gave him. And Daniel acknowledged the same thing. You know, Daniel had that important position for some 50, 60 years in the court in Babylon. And he asked, it says in, in Daniel 2.23, To thee, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for thou hast given me wisdom and strength. You've given me and you've, you've, put, you've made known to me the things I've asked of you. And so there's something to coming to a place of humbling ourselves and saying, God, speak to me. Give me understanding and wisdom in this decision that I have to make. Now, here's, there's, some, there's some cautions. You know, in any kind of decision, there's always cautions. And, and we don't want to make serious decisions in our life when we're angry or when we're hurt, when we're depressed, when we're desperate, when we're frightened. Uh, sometimes the the things we most regret doing, like texting something or emailing something when we're in, not in a right frame of mind, you know, we get ourselves in trouble and we have great regret. And we don't want to make decisions uh, out of revenge or uh, trying to get even with someone or harm someone. And we don't want to make decisions simply, you know, because uh, we're incapable of rational thought at the time. I mean, obviously, there comes a point of sleeping on it. I don't know about you, but I've found so many times, you know, when you're just, you're at wit's end, just to get a good night's sleep. How many have found that out? Just to get a good night's sleep. And it's amazing. I mean, sometimes God will even speak to you in a dream at night, but you say, and I don't know how many times I've woke up in the morning, it's like you wake up suddenly, you have this clarity of thought that you know what you should do or you know what the answer is to that problem you've been dealing with. And so there's something about going to bed, committing it to God, and trusting God, you know, to calm your spirit, and that out of that place of rest, you know, many times God speaks most readily to us when we're at a place of rest. Step into the shower, sink into a nice warm bath, and suddenly it just, you know, it's like clarity begins to come. You know, you just begin, because you're at peace, you're at rest, and, and oftentimes that's when our spirit's most open to receive from God when we're unrushed and we're calm. And so, now there are several sources of wisdom. First is the Bible, obviously. Uh, B-I-B-L-E, basic information before leaving earth. That's a, that's a good one to remember. B-I-B-L-E, basic information before leaving earth. They say, prevent tooth decay, brush up on your Bible. Have you ever heard that one before? I had a, uh, a mentor who was a biblical scholar, and he, uh, his library was so incredible that when he died, it was dedicated, it was given to a, a seminary. And, but you know what he used to say all the time to us? He used to say, I read gobs and gobs and gobs of the Bible. I, when I, you know, I'll sit down and just read gobs of the Bible. And that always stuck with me. And a lot of times, you know, when I'm really seeking God about something, and I learned this from him. Just begin to read gobs of the Bible. And as you read scripture, for me at least, it really works well. As you read scripture, you know, you're just asking God, speak to me. What do you want to say to me? There was a time when I was trying to make a major decision. I'd been at the, uh, the ch first church that we were part of. I'd, we'd been there for 22 years and in discussion with leadership. and different, We were feeling like it was time for a change in our life. And we were thinking about 
you know, maybe looking for another avenue of ministry. And, uh, but, you know, you, you're working through all this, but it's a huge decision because that's where we grew up in our Christian faith. And I, I was just one of those periods where I was just reading gobs of the Bible, and, you know, God just spoke to me one day, just dramatically, out of uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6, where Paul says, the time of my departure is at hand. Now, he was talking about his death, and I'm thinking, boy, I hope that doesn't mean I'm going to die. But, uh, you know, but that just jumped out at me. The time of my departure, I just felt the Lord spoke to me, and like, the time is now. Now's the time that I'm calling you to take this step of faith in another area of ministry for you and your wife. And, but it came because of that verse. It was just, you know how sometimes when God speaks, it's just a holy moment. In fact, when I read that verse, I just fell on my knees and began to weep because it went right into my spirit. And so, you know, God can ambush us as we just seek him in his word and trust him to speak to us out of the Bible. Obviously, godly people, you know, going to people for good advice. We were, we were in a situation where we were making a major investment in a, in a business. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, I mean, you can get advice from parents. You can get advice from, from uh, uh, mentors, uh, impartial, I always seek impartial people. You know, we, we sought advice. We, we went to a really successful Christian businessman. You know, you can get advice from experts. We went to a guy who we know was a prophet, and he prayed over us. We went to uh, uh, a, a person who had, uh, was a lawyer, a Christian lawyer, and asked him for advice. You know, we began to pull all kinds of people. And, you know, as you begin to ask a whole variety of people and get wise counsel, things begin to get clearer, too. And God begins to confirm. And oftentimes it's more of a confirmation than it is some new directive. It's confirming what God has already put in your spirit. And you just know that you know that this is what God has for me. And you get it from books. You can get it from audio, uh, podcasts. You know, God can speak in a myriad of ways. And it's good to open ourselves up to godly advice and see what he would say. And then uh, thirdly, uh, just prayerful thoughts. Prayerful thought. So what does that mean? Well, as you begin to define the problem and begin to weigh the options, just beginning to pray about it. Just, and, and as you think, you pray. Now, God has given us what's called baptized brains. How many of you know you have a baptized brain? Your brain isn't, you don't set that aside when you become a Christian. God can illuminate our brain. He can use our brain. It's, hopefully, when you got baptized, your head went under the water. If you got totally dunked, your brain got baptized too. And so, you know, he, he gives us, and, and when the Holy Spirit begins to speak, you know, you, you begin to, to get godly thoughts. And typically the Holy Spirit whispers. You know, the thoughts that come from God often are just whispers. And we have to be very sensitive, like that still, small voice. Still, still, small voice. We want to listen to what God is saying to us. Baptized brains. In James 1.5, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. The second thing you know, that's important in terms of how to make up our mind is just remembering the goodness of God. Just remind yourself of God's goodness expressed in the ways in which he answers our prayers, in his generosity. Reminding ourselves that God does answer prayer, and he wants to do us good in the end. God wants to do us good in the end. He loves to give good gifts. I love that. He loves to give good gifts. And he gives generously and doesn't condemn us for it. <clears throat> God is good all the time. Let's say that together. God is good all the time. He is. And do you know if, uh, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. It would. If God was on Facebook, he'd befriend you. If God had a wallet, your picture would be in the wallet. Just think about God's love. You know, if he had an unlisted number, he'd give it to you. And you can bet you're on his speed dial as well. God is good, and he loves to give good gifts. And I think it's good to continue to remind ourselves of God's generosity in God's goodness. He said, call to me and I will answer thee and show, them, show you great and mighty things which you have not even thought about.
unsearchable things. True story, there was a woman from Princeton, Minnesota. Her name was Brenda Foles, and she was out west, and she was rock climbing, this huge ascent. She was in the middle of it, and uh, in the middle of it, she got to a ledge, and she had kind of paused, and the safety rope, you know, she was harnessed into, snapped against her eye, and she had a contact, and her contact came out. And she was, and, and she was pretty blind without it, and uh, she immediately, she just cried out to God, and she was hoping it was kind of on that ledge where she kind of paused her, maybe it had stuck to her clothing, but it hadn't. So she had a couple hundred feet to go, she got all the way to the top, and then she and her party walked down, did the descent all the way down to the bottom of the climb, and there were some other climbers right there, and in the meantime, she's praying all the way, she's looking out across the mountains, and she's saying, God, you know, your eyes go to and fro throughout the earth, watching both evil and good. You see everything, God. I just cry out to you. When I get to the bottom, I want to be able to find my contact lens. You know, really. <laughs> but uh, So she gets to the bottom, and there's another group of climbers there, and some guy hollers out, did anybody lose a contact lens? <laughs> and here is an ant crawling along the edge of the wall, and it's carrying a contact lens. True story, it's carrying a contact lens. Now that is the goodness of God. There's no other way to explain it. That is the goodness of God. And so God, you know, again and again, you know, it's gonna, it'll come to pass before we call, he's gonna answer. It's amazing. So, and, and God's generosity, he doesn't chew us out because we're asking for wisdom. You know, a lot of times, you know, especially as a man, I don't like to stop and ask for directions. Uh, how many can say amen to that? Oh, 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 you know, I'll find my way. But you know, there's something about humility. There's nothing wrong with humbling ourselves and saying, I could use some advice. Could you give me some counsel on this? You know, we don't have to know everything. In fact, if we can acknowledge that we don't know everything, we can be really open to receiving something beyond ourselves. You know, there's safety in a multitude of counselors, the Bible says. And it says he gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so uh, next time, guys, when you're driving, listen to your wife. You know, that's the one thing God told Abraham. He said, listen to Sarah. How many women can say amen to that? No amen? Amen. So uh, God has ways to help us make up our mind. The next verse in James 1, 6, it says, but when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. The third thing in making up our mind is make the decision in faith. This is so important. You know, you've sought God for wisdom. You've, you've confessed and professed that he is generous. He's a good God. He wants to give us good things. And, and, you know, that's building our faith. But ultimately, ultimately, the decision comes down to really requiring the courage to step out in faith. To do it. To make the move. It's like Peter, you know, in Matthew 14, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking in the lake, and when the disciples saw him walking in the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. I think that's a word from Jesus for every major decision we have to make. Take courage, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come, come. And Peter, re and Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. At some point in every major decision, we have to get out of the boat. We have to step out in faith and we have to move out of our comfort zone into the unknown zone. And that's not always an easy thing to do. It really isn't. And, and sometimes our heart would just beat right out of our chest some of the important decisions that when I think of some of the important decisions I've had to make in my life, 
you know, it's with great trepidation and fear that you step out and take the plunge. But we want to do it in faith, and we don't want to doubt. I love this video clip. It's from an old movie, The Last Crusade, Indiana Jones, where his father is dying, and he's in pursuit of the Holy Grail, you know, the cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper. And, that's, and that is part of the answer to save uh, his father's life. And I'm just show this video clip real quick here. One time we were praying, this was years and years ago, as an eldership about a step of faith God was asking us to take as a church, and uh, God gave us, this was before the Indiana Jones movie, so uh, God gave us a vision of this suspension bridge, but there weren't any, there weren't any planks on it, and, uh, and God was asking us to take that step, and as we took that step, a plank appeared, and then when we lifted up our foot off the back, the back plank fell away. And it's like each plank was provided as we took that step of faith. And a lot of times it's that way, you know, when we're walking by faith and not by sight, uh, where God is asking us simply to trust him, just like Indy had to trust there and stepping, stepping out. And ultimately, you know, as we're praying through these steps of faith, one of the signs of, of faith comes out of Romans 15, 13. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him or in believing that you may overflow with hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. Joy and peace are signs that we've prayed ourselves into a place of faith, that we, we are at peace with God and we, and we actually can have joy in taking these steps because we know that God is with us and God is going to uphold us. Now, the big temptation, of course, that we always have to fight is doubt. And, uh, and in James 1, 6, it says, but when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And here's the problem with Peter. You know, Peter's walking toward Jesus, but then in verse 30, but when he saw the wind and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? What happened to Peter in that situation? He lost his focus. You know, he made a decision to go to Jesus, and if he had just kept his eyes on the prize, he wouldn't have had a problem. But, you know, when we begin to look around at things that would cause us to doubt, that would say that maybe we made the wrong decision, that maybe God isn't with us, and he sees the winds and the waves, uh, you know, he begins to sink. And that's why James says in, in, in the next verse, in verse 7 and 8, it says, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is double-minded man, unstable in all he does. 
And so the fourth thing that we need to always be mindful of in making up our mind is not be double-minded. Don't allow yourself to have buyer's remorse. I've had that when I bought a, I bought a van many years ago. And, uh, you know, I wrestled with buyer's remorse for months. And, and, and it says, don't be double-minded. And to be double-minded means to be two-souled. It's like, or to be two-minded. You've got a mind here and you've got a mind over there. You're looking here and you're looking there. You're not focused on the thing that God has called you to do. Another meaning from the Greek is half-hearted or wavering. And it's interesting, you know, the Bible talks about double-mindedness in a number of different places. David, in Psalm 119, where he's talking about his commitment to keeping God's decrees at the very end, it says in verse 113, 119, 113, I hate double-minded people, but I love your law. What is a double-minded person? They have divided loyalties. You know, maybe God is calling them to go here, and their heart's still back here. It's like Lot's wife. And Jesus said himself, remember Lot's wife. Learn from Lot's wife. If you're going to make a commitment to following me, Jesus said, keep your eyes on the prize. Don't let your heart draw you back. And that's why I love that old hymn, you know, that old song. You know, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. And in the Christian faith, in our walk with God, it's a wholehearted commitment. No double-mindedness. And there may be some people here this morning who have never made that first step toward Jesus. And Jesus is inviting you this morning to consider making that decision, that step of faith in your life, to put your life and your concerns into his hands and to trust him that he can do for you what you can't do for yourself, that there is forgiveness of sin, that there is the cleansing from all unrighteousness and guilt and shame, and he has a new life for you. And it, it, it calls for a step of faith, to step toward him and embrace him and to leave that old life behind. And that applies not only when we make that initial commitment to following Jesus, but it it, it affects every aspect of our life because there are always temptations to be double-minded. It's very real. Elijah, with the prophets of Baal, you know, he said, you can't be a fence straddler. In 1 Kings 18, 21, you know, he builds this altar and he's got all the prophets of Baal there and he says, he goes to the people and said, how long will you waver or halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. How long will you waver between two opinions? There may be some people here that are wavering between two opinions. You maybe make a decision to do something, but you're having second thoughts. And The call of faith is a call to leave it all behind and embrace what God is calling us to. It's it's as if God is saying, I want you to burn the bridges. I want you to close the door once and for all and make this your life and your decision. Harry Truman said, I want a one-handed man. Not somebody who says on one hand this and on the other hand that. You know, I want a one-handed man. I can remember when uh, God was speaking to us about stepping into something new, and, you know, I had that word, uh, the time of your departure is at hand, and as we wrestled through it, I felt like God was calling us to be a church, church planters, that Susan and I were to invest our life in planting a church, and I was wrestling back and forth with this, back and forth, and I was on my morning run one morning, and uh, running along the service road in Blaine there, paralleling Highway 65, which is a divided highway, a 55-mile-an-hour highway. And, uh, you know, as I'm on, on my run, I'm just going back and forth, back and forth. And suddenly just the peace of God came over me, and I just realized, I'm going to do it. We're going to step out in faith and do this. I'm going to trust God. I'm leaving it all behind. No more double-mindedness. I'm making a commitment. And, and just a joy flooded my heart as I'm jogging along there. And suddenly I look up. And coming off Highway 65, I'm going north in the service road, coming off the southbound lane is a car comes right off the road, right up to the ditch, and it's heading right for me at 55 miles an hour. 
And I just ran and dove in the ditch off the service road, and this car just missed me, and it went screening off into this open field and finally came to a, a halt. And I'm thinking, what was that? And I ran over the car, and there was a woman in the car who was having a seizure. And I prayed for her, and by then, somebody had seen it happen. Another car pulled up, and they called 911. And I was shaking. I was just literally shaking, and I could barely run the rest of the way home. And I began to think to myself, what was that all about? And I thought, devil, you're just trying to take me. I just made this major decision in my life, and the devil's trying to take, take me out. And I thought, you overplayed your hand, buddy. I know for sure what I'm called to do now. And you know, sometimes double minus, it's like when you get so much of that going on, eventually you just realize, I must be making the right choice because I've gotten so much warfare and resistance and all this other stuff. God has called me to this. And that sealed the deal. It really did. It sealed the deal for me in my, in my life. And so God is calling us to close the door, to burn the bridge. We had a vision one time. We were praying for our church, and it was going through a season of difficulty, and, and the Lord gave us vision of stones. It was like the, the, we had this vision of the temple being built, and these huge stones were being placed in the wall, but some stones had legs, and they began to walk off. <laughs> and you put this stone in place, and it would get off and walk off. And it's like the Lord was just challenging us as a church, you know, make a commitment, make a decision. You know, where has God called you? What has God called you to do? And, uh, and, and to drive a stake in the ground. No more double-mindedness. Come near to God, James writes, and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know, he's appealing, James is appealing to us to make a commitment. And uh, I just... Uh, want to encourage and challenge whatever you're wrestling with. Don't be double-minded. Don't, don't let double-mindedness rob you. Don't let second thoughts rob you of the good things that God has for you in your life. Make a decision and trust God, and you know what? The blessing of God will come on it. And when you fight your way through in faith, the blessing of God will come on it. The anointing of God will come on it. This quote from John Kebbell, he was an 18th century English church leader, and I think it's a good quote. He said, once you make up your mind never to stand waiting and hesitating, when your conscience tells you what you ought to do, you have got the key to every blessing that a sinner can reasonably hope for. Don't second guess yourself. No more second thoughts. Don't let anything rob you of the commitment that you've made. And uh, you've heard this before, but don't doubt in the dark what you saw in the light. Our youngest daughter, you know, we have five kids, and you wrestle with all your children about where they should go to college, what they should do with their lives after they graduate from high school. And this was one of those deals where she wanted to be a doctor. She wanted to get into a good program, a pre-med program, and get into a good school with the hope of getting into the University of Minnesota Medical School. And anyway, long story short, she ended up uh, deciding on Carleton College in Northfield. And uh, at the time, Carleton College was on Dobson, James Dobson's 10 worst colleges for a Christian person to go to because they were sure to lose their faith. And that factored in, and there were so many different things swirling around that decision but, you know, we prayed about it, and wonder of wonders, they had a, a scholarship uh, grant sort of endowment that went back to the, like, 19, early 1900s, for, set aside. It was apparently at one time there was a, a missionary that had gone to school there, and they had endowed a scholarship, and it was for the daughter or son of a Christian pastor or missionary. And... My daughter snagged that one. It's like it was a gift from God. And we just felt, God, you're confirming it. You know, even though it's not the perfect situation, we just, we just felt God's in this. And she was, our daughter loved the Lord and everything else, and we didn't want her to lose her faith. And anyway, so we took her there, and she just had the 
roughest time. The first weeks were just hell for her. She, and she thought she'd made the wrong decision. And we went down there, and she was crying. And we're out in front of this, one of these big vine-covered buildings with this huge white oak tree under this white oak tree. And we're praying with her. And, and uh, she just wanted to drop out of school. She just hated it. And we just felt to encourage her, you know, it's like we're thrown into the lion's den here. But, you know, so we just felt got no double minus. We're going to believe. And we took a picture of her because we didn't see her all that much. We took a picture of her by that oak tree. Well, you know what happened. God blessed her. She found another group of Christians. She had a a really close-knit community that she became a part of, uh, of faith and uh, they, their badge of honor that they were in the worst school, one of the top worst schools in the country for Christians, and their badge of honor was, you know what, we're shining lights here. And so when she graduated four years later, we took a picture of her again by that oak tree. It's a, they're precious pictures to us. One, she's got tears in her eyes, she's got a red face, and then this oak tree, she didn't want to be there. Four years later, she's smiling, and God was good and proved to be faithful. And here's the bottom line. Man plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. And no matter, even if you make a bad decision, a wrong decision, you know what? God's bigger than all of that, and he'll make something good come out of it. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you, Father, for your promises and your word that uh, call us to ask for wisdom, to remember your goodness, to make a decision in faith, and not to be double-minded. And I pray, Lord, for whoever in this room or watching online is facing a really difficult decision in their life, that the Holy Spirit might come alongside them right now and whisper peace and joy in their heart and in their ears, and that, God, they might know what, that they know that they know what you're calling them to do. And, Lord, we thank you that those who are maybe dealing with regret and second thoughts, uh, Father, we pray for your peace. We pray for deliverance from double-mindedness and a clarity to come that drives a stake in the ground and closes the door and moves on in what you have for them. Lord, we ask you for that now in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. amen. There's prayer teams available. Go in the peace of Jesus.